ವರ್ಣಿವೇಶರಮಣೀಯದರ್ಶನ ಮಂದಹಾಸರುಚಿರಾನಂಬುಜ ಪೂಜಿ ಸುರನರೋತ್ತಮೇರ್ಮುದ ಧರ್ಮನಂದನಮಹಂ ವಿಚಿಂತೈ ಧರ್ಮನಂದನಮಹಂ ವಿಚಿಂತೈ ಶ್ರೀಗಣಶ್ಯಾಂ ಮಹಾರಾಜನೀಜೈ ಆಲ್ಮೈಟಿ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಲಾಡ್ ಅವರ್ ಬಿಲೌಡ್ ಕನ್ಸ್ಯಾಮ್ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ಪಾತ್ಮ ಕಠೋ ಲಿಬ್ರೇಷನ್ ಅವರ್ ಪೂಜ್ಯ ಗುರುಜಿ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಡ್ಯೂಟೀಸ್ ಜೈ ಸ್ವಾಮಿನಾರಾಯಣ್ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿನಾರಾಯಣ್ ಮ್ಯಾನಿಫೆಸ್ಟ್ ಆನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಅರ್ಥ್ ಇನ್ ವಿಕ್ರಮ್ ಸೌಂತ್ ಏಟೀನ್ ಥರ್ಟಿ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಬಟ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಹಿಮ್ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ call a meeting in aksar dham so there was a meeting in aksar dham and we know not an ordinary or even not who is a devotee can enter in aksar dham without the wishes of bhagwan himself so in aksar dham there is only uh, there were only muktos there so bhagwan seated on his divine sihansan meaning his divine seat and maharaj himself call his uh, some of selected muktos which known as anadi muktos muktanan swami gopalanan swami brahmanan swami gunaditanan swami there are many many thousands of muktos in aksar dham now bhagwan himself ask a question to all those muktos why are not even a single jeev meaning soul come here in our aksar dham from this brahman meaning our this universe then santo muktos they answer as maharaj you never visited in this brahman this universe so nobody know about you and as they have no any kind of knowledge regarding your divine form your greatness your glory then how can they worship you and without worshiping you without your upas now nobody can reach here in aksarda now bhagwan swami rar himself ask those santo that now what we should do so that countless millions of jeevs come here in aksar dham from this world then santosh said maharaj you have to go there there is no any other way then maharaj said it's okay i'll go there in this world in this universe but who can uh there are many people not doubt will come in my contact but how can they recognize me as i am the supreme lord and for that purpose you all should also come with me in this brahman and that's why when you you will do work hard and you will preach the people regarding my supremacy regarding my glory my greatness the divine bliss and happiness of aksar dham the even in this world the most of the people they are not live their lives according to the righteousness so for that purpose you all should also come with me to this brahma and then after when you preach whenever any person or anybody come in your contact in your company and because of your preaching and teaching they can understand my true knowledge and because of this knowledge they all worship me and because of worshiping me they can be reach up to this aksar dham then santo said okay maharaj and in this way bhagwan swami and himself manifested on this earth in vikram sound 1837 but at the same time 
some some of the muktas come before maharaj and some come with maharaj and some later on all gather in gujarat with maharaj and they started their divine mission to preach real knowledge of bhagwan supremacy who is the god who is the self and how one can reach from here to aksardham everything they started but as bhagwan swaminar himself a commander all those muktas to come with him on this earth so muktanand swami gopanand swami all those santos they also manifested as a human being on this earth and today in bhakti chintamani 142 chapter we are going to discuss such uh one of mukt his life his life's incident how he was such powerful like that of god there are many many incident yes in this chapter sadguru nisbran swami wrote about gopanand swami's virtuous life his divine power his divine strength like that of maharaj himself in this way nisbran swami read down many incident in this same chapter only regarding and concerning uh concerning with, uh, with the life of gopanand swami gopanand swami he was born on this he was he manifested on this earth in the same year of maharaj's birth but the place was different maharaj manifested on this earth in vikram sant 1837 in chapaya northern part of india whereas gopanand swami took birth on this earth as a human being in the same year 1837 but in different place from maharaj gopanand swami took birth as a human being in the town of todla which is situated on northern part of gujarat near the eder <clears throat> and that's why sadguru nisgunanand swami wrote here in bhakta chintamani अनुप ईडर देश मन्य धन्य टोडला गाम धन्य धन्य द्विज निजाति ने ज्या उपन्या भक्त अकाम सो द मीनिंग ऑफ दिस वर्ड्स सद्गुरु निस्कुरानंद स्वामी रार इन दिस वर्ड्स दैट Sadguru Gopalanand Swami born as a human being in a house of a brahmin in Todla near Eder and Nisbulan Swami read down Gopalanand Swami brief but still precise introduction like he was not like an ordinary person like us but he uh, he was a direct come from aksardham and he is manifested not alone but with the maharaj by birth he is the master of yoga and many other things then after Nisgunan Swami wrote here in the chapter that uh, what is the exact nature of Gopanand Swami as he is a kid meaning uh, in his childhood how he behaved as we know or as whenever we studied any life sketch of any great persons meaning only ekantik sant then in their lives they have passed their childhood not in playing with the other peoples 
they are they have no kind of anything like that of the other child they are totally different they have no kind of attachment with their bodily meaning parents uh, the friends with nothing the another thing is that they have no kind of attachment with the playing meaning games or toys or any other things in the same way sadguru in the life of gopalan and swami the same thing happened he had no kind of attachment he, he had no any kind of interest in worldly life not playing not eating nothing that's why as he had no interest in anything so he worship bhagwan even in his childhood let we see compare this incident with our guruji's in our guruji's life we can easily see his childhood that there are many many incident in his childhood which shows his divinity at the very little age when guruji was only 6 years old at the time he narrated in a school the story regarding the supremacy of bhagwan swami narayan not only that but whenever he plays with the other kids other children or the students in school or in his village he plays only such kind of games which has any kind of contact with god whenever he plays with his friends in a village and when they uh, as we know in india in remote village the boys meaning kids they play with uh, clay and uh, and they made earthen uh, toys like animals like house and in this way they play now guruji himself also joined with his friends but they have totally different kind of uh, the, their system of playing games that that is totally different our puja guru ji he was playing with other uh, with his friends but he made small temples with the help of stone pebbles and some wooden sticks and in this way he made a small temple and in the temple even in his very little age with his friends Guruji celebrated big fa- uh, fa- fa- most of the festivals like Ekadashi, Janmashtami, the birthday of Maharaj, meaning Hari Jayanti. In this way, our Guruji celebrated the all of the most of festivals with his friends in his very little age. Even at that age, nobody can think about Bhagwan. now the another incident there are so many incident we have the same which shows us the same divinity in life of guruji many times guruji also meditated upon the form of god even in his very little age we cannot see anybody even today that even a small child or small boy he sat for meditation even younger or even the older they cannot set for meditation then how we can imagine the same thing for a child but when we compare such kind of incident which totally different from the others then we can understand this person is not of this world they are totally different they are not like us just as here in life of gopalan and swami he behaves totally different from others in the same way guruji also behave with others totally different and that's why we can understand by his childhood charitra meaning his childhood past times we can understand he is not like us he is totally different 
just as gopanand swami is divine our guru ji is also divine now gopanand swami has no any kind of attachment and interest in worldly life so he had started worshiping bhagwan now because of worshiping bhagwan he got a divine power in his own body not doubt he was directly coming here from aksardham but still because of worshiping god he got a divine power in his own form and because of this divine power there are too much meaning a mass of divine light appear over there and these mass of divine light could be seen even at the areas of miles and miles as people never experience such kind of uh divine light and so they all frightened they have fear that this is a uh, definitely time of final destruction even after some time in this mass of divine light there are very uh, divine sounds very divine uh sounds and some blinking of like a lightning strike in the same way there are many thing happens in the divine light but after that when because of maharaj wish all this divine light is absorbed in gopanand swami's body then at that time all understood the divine glory and divinity of gopanand swami Gopalanand Swami's childhood name was Kusal Bhat. So all those people who came even one once in contact of Kusal Bhat, they all have understood his divine status, that this is not an ordinary person. After that, once upon another day, the same thing happened after such kind of divine light and everything happened to gopanand swami after that bhagwan himself came to his own body and because of bhagwan's uh, manifestation in his own heart gopanand swami remained as kusal bhat but still he is totally different now from that day whatever he wishes the same thing happened and because of that power this is the power of bhagwan himself but bhagwan himself come in gopanand swami's body so gopanand swami had also the same power and that's why whenever the people have any kind of problem they immediately approach kusal bhat and they narrated their problems and gopanand swami meaning kusal bhat he without any kind of charge or without any delay he immediately prayed to maharaj and maharaj immediately solved their problem there are many many incident regarding this kind of divinity of gopanand swami meaning his divine power like that of maharaj read down in this 142 chapter of bhakta chintamani but we will continue it on next sunday by saying this jai swami narayan shri ganshyam maharaj ni jai
I even know what the Bible says. I just want to go in the line. Of Namo Muktananda Prabhupadatana Seva Kasada Mahasastra Bhyasi Vedatana Gumave Padakada Kare Varta Jare Surasarita Dhara Samavahe Kusangi Satsangi Sakala jana chitte ati jahe Kusangi satsangi Sakala jana chitte ati jahe Gansham Maharaj Nije Hare Krishna Maharaj Nije Swami Narayan Bhagavan Nije Supreme Almighty our beloved Gansham Maharaj The path maker to our liberation our beloved, our utmost dear, Puja Guruji, Puja Santo, Puja Bhagatji, all of you devotees, Jai Swami Nare. Have you ever heard of the quote, In the joy of others lies our own? I'm sure you have. There are many, many quotes out there that give us inspiration, that give us some kind of internal strength to do something for others, or at least to strive forward in one's life. But this quote applies not only for the world, but it also applies for the spiritual world. And that's what we're going to learn today. But what's the ugly truth about human beings? That's my question to you today. What is the ugly tr truth? about human beings it's going to be a little harsh think about it but the answer is that we're all selfish in one way or another we may see it we may not but it is what it is it's reality an American psychologist by the name of David Seabury once said no man will work for your interests unless they are his. Meaning, he's showing the motive of a person that he would do his, he would do your work only if there is some kind of interest for him, some kind of benefit. Meaning, this is a selfish motive. Now stop and think. Think about the last time you helped someone without thinking or at least having some kind of intention that that person will give you something in return. Maybe it's something in the form of money or maybe some kind of oral, fra oral praise like you did a really great job, something like that. I'm sure there probably hasn't been a time maybe one out of 100 that we haven't thought like this, that we probably had some kind of intention towards the opposite person for some kind of oral or some kind of physical materialistic praise or something like that. For example, we may lend a friend some money with the expectation that he'll return it in favor when we need it. Obviously, when we give someone some money, we think or we know or we at least have that feeling in the back of our mind that one day, maybe in the near future or in the future, that person will give us that particular money back when we ask them to. Now, if there was some kind of term set, yeah, Sure, that person has to return the money. But without any kind of terms, when you give something to someone, automatically your mind develops the thought that 
hmm, maybe in one or two weeks, I'm going to ask for the money and he's going to give it back. It's just human nature. Our human nature is to do something for someone, sure, but in return also expect something else. That expectation is the very reason why we are, you can say miserable, or you can say clueless about our own benefit, if I can say. Now, <clears throat> as we do things for others, we always expect something. That's the main question at hand, right? But what if I told you there are, I can say humans, to help you explain much better, on this earth that do not expect anything. And we can even see in society right now, we can see Mahatma Gandhi. He, you can say, pretty much was the father of India. How so? Well, he completely, you can say, British was under the rule, or British was ruling India, and he was pretty much the one who did such kinds of boycotts, you can say, and rebellious acts, but in a very, very calm manner to free India from the clutches of Great Britain. Doing so, he did such a service without expecting anything. Even if you take a look at, at a photo of him, if you go to Google Images right now and type in Mahatma Gandhi, you'll see images of him wearing just one or two pieces of cloth, simple white cloth. You see his body. He's very, very skinny. He has these simple glasses and a stick, and this is it. What to learn from him, his life? He did such kinds of work without any kind of selfish motive. I'm sure I can even say by what he believes in, his philosophy, his religious, you can say, background, that he probably didn't expect any kind of ego, egotistic phrase like you are our father or any kind of phrase that will boost his ego. <clears throat> Due to that, people still remember him. Another example, Mother Teresa. She was a nun who helped poor people around the world without any kind of selfish motive. A great example there. Not so much for any kind of, you can say, money or consent, but just how her name is praised, Mother Teresa. She, she had the nature of like a mother where she helped each and every child. She would take poor homeless child into her hand, feed them herself. Such kinds of treatments, such kinds of acts, proving that she also had a selfish motive. But these are the poor people of the world. They boosted the world. They helped the world out. But have you ever heard of a person, a spiritual person, that has boosted someone, a part of the world, another person or another organization or any kind of group without any kind of selfish motive, even without any kind of intention of praise, of any kind of materialistic pleasure, or just nothing, just a factor to please God. Well. The only example I can think of and the only example that comes to my mind and I know of is our Puja Guruji. We simply have to look at our beloved Guruji for his inspiration. Guruji is an ideal or an icon of compassion and forgiveness. He truly is a symbol of selfless service. Well, how so? Well, I'm going to tell you an incident about his real life 
what he goes through and an incident that happened maybe a couple of years ago just to show you this is just one prasang or story there are many but selflessness is something that is you can't learn it i can say uh it's not taught it's something that comes from the heart it develops in the heart and the only way that it can develop is if that person number one has god completely inside of him meaning god lives through that saint and works through that saint that's number one and number two if by nature somehow from the beginning of your birth you had a caring nature this is another way that can happen but it can be taught let's just let me give you an example that i don't have any kind of inclination to help someone out but i see that another person is helping someone out and getting praise he's not expecting but getting some kind of praise so then i do the same kind of act so i also receive praise number one your intention is wrong and number two you're not doing it from the heart meaning it's not teachable even by looking it's something that is within you and the other reason i told you is because god himself lives inside of such a person and does his works and god himself has a nature of compassion forgiveness selflessness so moving on puji guru ji always tells his devotees in katha you can say that we should serve the devotees of bhagwan swami narayan anyone the sadhus devotees anyone that is a refuge a refugee of bhagwan swami narayan we should serve him without any kind of selfish motive in puji guru's katha this will always come but regarding his statement to back it up we can only look to the scriptures because if you want to check anything about any person a great saint a devotee or any kind of person one should develop or one should learn to develop by checking in the scriptures what do the scriptures say are they true is it true do these characteristics match and if they do then you can understand that that person is who he really is and he's not showing it so what do i mean if guruji just says just a statement he remarks numerous times that we should serve the devotees of god that includes all santos bhaktos everyone male devotees female devotees without any kind of selfish motive what is he saying well in the vachanamrut i want to read a paragraph of shri ji maharaj's vani his speech to show you how or how the sat purush operates meaning how is his what are his qualities and off of his qualities his attributes his actions do match so in the vachanamrut garuda first chapter 67th maharaj himself says thereupon shri ji maharaj asked the munis meaning santos there is a sat purush who has no affection at all for the pleasures of this world he harbors desires only for the higher realms the abode of god and for the form of god he also wishes the same for whoever associates with him he feels as this individual has associated with me it would be great it would be a great benefit to the individual if his desires for the world are eradicated and his affection for god is developed furthermore all the efforts the satpurush makes are only for acquiring bliss after attaining the abode of god after death but he never does anything for the sake of bodily comfort bodily comforts this is the paragraph i want to discuss with you now shri ji maharaj is stating and characterizing 
the qualities of an ekantik satpurush, a true God-realized, self-realized sadhu. Now, first and foremost, some of these characteristics are a little off topic, but since Maharaj has said it, we should just go over and quickly reference them. He has no affection for the pleasures of this world. Now, just think about it. A person who has some kind of selfish motive, can he have any kind of attachment, affection for this world? It just doesn't match. Meaning, that's number one. Number two, he harbors desires only for the higher realms. Meaning, again, a person who does not wish for any of this world and wishes for beyond our comprehension, Akshardham, he must obviously not have anything to do with any people or any concern of some kind of selfish motive. That's number two. He also wishes the same for whoever associates with him. Now let me ask you a question. Those who come to such to those who come to associate with such kind of sadhu, does he first ask that before I teach you the knowledge of the scriptures so you can understand God, I have a small token that you have to give me. Or you have to buy me a certain amount of things, a list I will give you, and then you, I will give you my knowledge. Or you will have to give me this many grains, or this much food, or this much clothes, or even the smallest thing. You will have to give me a pen, a brand new pen, bring it to me next or tomorrow and I will give you my knowledge not even the smallest objects in the world no kind of desire when a person sits in front of an ekantik satpurush he has this thought in mind that I want to take this person to what wherever level I am at this is his vision he has no selfish motive of this world or no materialistic pleasure of this world this is the characteristic of an Ekantik Satpurush. As this individual has associated with me, it would be of great benefit to this individual if his desires for the world are eradicated and his affection for God is developed. This is his intention. Now, I want you to remember this whole, you can say, paragraph of Maharaj, what he's describing. And throughout this prasang, I tell you of Puja Guruji, Think about it if it matches, okay? So here we go. Now, Buja Guruji, about seven years ago or eight years ago, he became the chairman of Vartal Mandir, meaning it's a post of this very high temple which has another 1,500 branch temples underneath it. And by the commands of Maharaj, there's two kinds of divisions in the Swaminarayan sect and Puja Guruji became you can see the chairman, the head priest of a temple board by the name of Vartal now I'm sure all of you, most of you who are listening have heard of this when Puja Guruji took this position he had relentless vichran, meaning relentless running around throughout Gujarat and outside of Gujarat meeting and greeting devotees, other saints, going for works of looking at construction sites uh, for new, build, um, new temples. So much work. And only one Guruji. Now, Guruji would go around every day in his car. He would travel 200 miles a day. And each and every day, at least 200 miles he would cover. Because Gujarat has so many different different religions and there's so much work going on it's a vast vast place so his distance his his travel also increases that way so one day guruji was traveling from vartal from kandari to vartal and just a couple minutes into his car ride as they were going guruji spotted maybe in the near distant 20, 30 feet while the car was traveling, a very, very poor person without any clothes, very minimal, and who was very, very poor and his very fragile body was 
meaning he had no food, no kind of finan- financial assets, nothing. Puja Guruji spotted that and immediately he told Ranshad Bhagat, who was the driver of Puja Guruji, to immediately stop by that person there. Right there and then, Guruji stopped his car. He went outside and he greeted the person. The person explained his whole situation that he had no money, he had no he hadn't eaten for two days, he had minimal clothes. So Puja Guruji was traveling to Vartal and had brought his puja, his clothes, and had some water and prasad in his car. Now Right there and then, he, what he did was first, the time was 11.30 a.m. And Kandari was just very close to uh, where they were. So he, Vignan Swami was also with Puja Guruji. So he told Vignan Swami to go back to Kandari with another priest, Kandari Gurukul, and get some uh, tiffin, get some uh, food packed up and bring it back to give to this poor person. While he sent Vignan Swami, while that was going on, he was talking to this poor man. And the poor man was obviously crying due to his situation and explaining everything. Puja Guruji, right there and then, stood up, went to the back of the car, told Ranchabhaga to open the trunk, and he took out his own clothes, not even Ranchabhaga's clothes. Ranchabhaga is a parsad, meaning... He is, he wears white clothes. There's two levels, just briefly to explain that, Parsad and Sadhu. A Parsad is pretty much in training to become a Sadhu. Now there's also Parsads uh, who stay Parsads for life. Ranchur Bhagat is one of them, but his clothes were white. And he also brought two or three pairs of clothing in his back. So he had his. Puja Guruji had his pair as well, two or three pairs. Puja Guruji himself got his own clothes, took them out, two or three pairs, and gave it to him. And he actually, the real story is that Puja Guruji actually put those clothes, wrapped those clothes around that man so that he would not be cold or obviously he would not suffer any kind of damage to his body. The, the clothes would protect him. Not only that, but there was some small prasad and water in the car. Puja Guruji told another Swami to come uh, to get it and give it to him. So he also gave, them, he gave him that. Now, just think about it. A small prasang. Nothing to do with anything, right? Going on a task, going, on in, going to Vartal as the chairman... Uh, of 1500 temples who he has control of these temples such a kind of position he's on his way he sees a person he spots him just imagine in India there's so many people like that but Puja Guruji his heart what does it say his heart what how what does he feel well num- let me tell you the great Ekantik Satpurush his heart is always soft he is always looking at human beings, animals, in such a compassionate way that we are not able to calculate his vision. But they are always soft. And such kind of soft, Ekandik Sadpurush, his nature, when he sees such kind of person, obviously he's going to feel that I should help this person out. But what I'm trying to tell you is, most of you who are Swami Narayan and at night time do Nityaniyam, there's a section called Cheshta. Cheshta is pretty much in Bhagwan Swami Narayan's time. There is whatever daily routines that Bhagwan did was narrated by Sadguru Preman and Swami and written down. And in the Cheshta, pretty much it narrates Bhagwan's day to day, you can say, routine. And in one of those Verses, Praman Swami writes because he saw this by his own eyes. Dukhyo dekhi na kamai daya ani re ati akara thai an dan vastra apin duktare. Meaning, Puja Guruji not only gave food, clothes.
clothing, but also told another devotee by the name of Murji Bhagat, who was with him, to give him some money so that he can obviously suffice for a couple of days and he would be obviously he, his life would last longer he would be able to buy food clothing and he would be able to progress in his life now in this line that i read dukhyo dekhi na khamai daya aani re ati aankda thai an dhan vastra api duktare meaning such kind of maharaj's nature at that time was that he could not see anyone who was very very miserable financially or of any, any kind of misery and due to that maharaj would give un meaning food dhan meaning money and vastra meaning clothes to anyone he saw in such kind of position if i can say this exactly matches puja guruji's nature now the only way that bhagwan's nature can match puja guruji's nature is that if there are one if there is some kind of connection a constant connection if there is a oneness between them that's the only way it would happen now remember i told you in the beginning that there's two kinds of people who can be selfless one is a person that pretty much is has a nature from the beginning of when he was born and then he realizes as he grows up that he likes to see others happiness without any kind of praise or any kind of other motives and number 2 he likes or number 2 is that god himself lives inside of such kind of saint and does his work that's the only way this could happen proving that maharaj and puja guruji's oneness is something that is remarkable something that is beyond our comprehension but it is in our comprehension by this story a small story but proving that puja guruji's life is not a simple life yes a simple life in one way but a very complex life in the way of if we were to dissect his actions and apply the vachanamrut to his actions whatever characteristics shri ji maharaj has mentioned about the ekantik satpurush in the vachanamrut exactly matches puja guru ji's whole life making him praise worthy of becoming his you can say disciple becoming connected with him and associating with him but our main lecture our main subject at hand was in the joy of others lies our own what does this mean meaning if we help someone selflessly we will have or we will develop some kind of joy in our puja guruji's life we see this and puja guruji is happy in this way but we can also develop some kind of happiness we can also develop some kind of you can say qualities of the ekantik satpurush by understanding his intentions and by associating with him saying this my humble jay swaminarayan